Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to the Logatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible True series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And so, welcome to a very special episode. This is the fourth, four hundredth episode of Logatos. It's a uh, quite an accomplishment, you know. And uh, we've talked about this, you know, when we first started it. That it's, uh, you know, people have asked, well, how come you do? Why do you do uh, five episodes a week? You know, Monday through Friday. And it's not easy to do because we have to. Uh, you know, we have to record these and we have to plan and and uh, it really is a lot of work, but I believe it will it will uh, it, it is uh, sown into good ground. You know, uh, it's a labor of love. You know, we uh, I truly felt God told me to do it. Uh, hopefully it's helpful to people. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason that we do it, uh, we do so many episodes and that's why we're at 400, you know, episodes because we've you know, we've been doing this over a year. I think it's been over, maybe it hasn't been over a year, but it's been a while. And, uh, you know, it's easy to get to this many episodes when you do as many episodes a week as we do. Most uh, uh, vlogs or podcasts, you know, we'll, we'll just maybe do one one thing a week or, or a couple things a week, but we do five. And uh, the reason for that is to show consistency, you know, to say this is possible to uh, be in the Word this often. You know, and as of late, the episodes have been uh, longer, you know, uh, because of the way that the book of Job is. Um, but, uh, you know, typically we try to keep the episodes between 20 and 30 minutes. Uh, but uh, anyway, so um, uh, we, uh, the reason, you know, the, the, we, we do this, I, it's just a couple of things I should mention again, since it is the 400th episode that we do read out of the NLT, this New Living Translation. Um some people would argue that it's more of a paraphrase than a translation. Uh, fair enough, you know. Um, and uh, see our poor dog in the in, in the back. He's had to he's he's had has a cone on his head because he has um, had to have a medical treatment, and he is not allowed to uh, to uh, chew to reach back and 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 bite it himself. Uh, but anyway, so. A very appropriate thing to have happen on the 400th episode. That's great. So then, um, uh, the reason that we uh, that we read out of the NLT is because this translation is uh, made to be read out loud. Um, and again, like I said, some people would argue that it's really a paraphrase and not a translation. There is a difference between a paraphrase and a translation. A paraphrase is going to contain a lot of opinion, and there are certainly parts of the NLT that I would say. Uh, read like a paraphrase. In fact, uh, the reason I mentioned it is because we're going to hit a couple of statements in here that are made that uh, don't agree with uh, uh, the majority of other translations, and so that when that then would render it like a, like a paraphrase um, in the in those particular areas, and that does make a big difference when you're interpreting scripture. And so this is why I say, you know, when you study scripture, you really should have more than one translation. To see how how they agree together and how they uh, how they read one another, um, you know that's, that's a that's a good way to go about Bible study. And um, so then again, we call it vlogatos, uh, and it is a uh, amalgamation of the two words vlog, which is video log, and veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. So vlogatos. So why we call it that? I think it's been a long time since I've you know mentioned why we call it that, but I figured it's appropriate. At, right here at the 400th episode. So let's go ahead and pray and jump right in because I really feel in my heart like I have a lot of ground I want to cover and I don't want to, um, you know, get into extremely deep stuff here. So I want to have the time. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that this word is active, alive, and powerful even today. It doesn't matter how long ago it was written, but it is still sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and uh, joint and marrow. And I thank you for this word, Lord God, that it affects our, our body, it affects our, our soul, it affects our spirit, man. I thank you for the truth contained within these pages, Lord God, the essence of your word contained in here. And I believe, Lord, that it's benefiting us even now. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so Job has finished his long uh, discourse, his long you know monologue, and he has uh, finished his self-examination. And again, the examination in itself was not wrong, but he justified himself before God. And you can take that in more than one way, you know, uh, rather than God or in front of God, you know, and so in so doing, um, it, 
it paints God into a negative light, which it should not have done. And so I don't believe that that was Job's intention, but there is such a thing as, and this is a major, going to be a major um, concept that, that comes out, out here uh, throughout this other, what this other guy, Elihu, is about to say. And uh, the idea that in so doing, in doing something, you know, in persisting in a certain way, we can actually, uh, it can actually become like this, the, there's a, there can be a side effect that we did not intend, you know. And so we, the perfect example we can, we can see is when uh, Samuel told Saul that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And so I've heard people say, use that example and say, uh, well, then rebellion is witchcraft. No. He said rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft because there are people who intend to do witchcraft. And again, we've, you know, the, I've given a definition of witchcraft before, which is trying to accomplish some supernatural result and going around God to do it. That is witchcraft. And so there are people who intentionally engage in witchcraft, but then there are people who engage in rebellion against God. And it is as the sin of witchcraft. So even though they are not intending to engage in witchcraft, they, they're, by their actions, they, are, they have accomplished the same thing as somebody who does engage in witchcraft. And so it, it's like it, is, um, it, is, it skews the same in God's eyes, even though it's not the same because the effects are similar. And so, uh, so then there's a lot more people who engage in rebellion against God than people who directly engage in witchcraft. And so, no, it's not the same thing, but it achieves the same effect, you know? And so, uh, it, it kind of like, uh, we can look at it, how Paul, uh, talked about the gift of tongues because it can work for good things too. Okay. So like, uh, he said that he said, if, if somebody, if he said that he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. And when he said speaks in tongues, he's talking about the office of speaking in tongues, a ministry of speaking in tongues, because he said that the reason that somebody, that he who speak, prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues is because the one who prophesies edifies the entire body because everybody can understand what they're saying. He's like, but somebody who only ministers in tongues who has the the office of ministry of tongues he's like they they let him also pray that he interpret too because if he if he speaks out an utterance in tongues nobody can understand what he's saying so it's not going to edify the body but if there is somebody there who can interpret or if they themselves interpret let it be accepted the same as prophecy and again not all prophecy is is a prophecy is not to be unquestionable because paul said let all prophecy be judged and so you have to uh, judge prophecy. Prophecy, if somebody who is operating in the gift of prophecy, yeah, let them speak it out in all the faith that they have, but let them be willing to submit it for judgment to the church so the church can discern it and decide for themselves based on the word, okay, is this, does this agree with what the Bible says? And if it does, then I can hold fast to it because it's good. That's, that's, so that's, this is the, that is the order of things. But so why did I say that? It's because I'm saying that this, principle or this this concept of something uh being as something else even though it is not exactly that thing because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft okay so then uh that means then that it can work for good things too so then tongues with interpretation can be seen as prophecy though it is not the same thing in other words it equals prophecy so then rebellion equals witchcraft it is not witchcraft in and of itself, but it equals that. So then the uh, tongues and interpretation would equal prophecy. Okay. So then uh, the reason that I bring that up is because it's very important when we get into this, these next few chapters where Elihu speaks to understand that, that concept and because it comes up more than once. So then uh, now Elihu is this guy who's a kind of like a bystander. We don't know when he arrived, but he's been there long enough that he's listened to what all the friends have said and what Job has said. And uh, when God comes on the scene, which he, he's already there, of course, but when he reveals his direct presence and he says, uh, you know, he talk, begins to talk to them, he says, Job, his, his, Job's three friends spoke wrong. And he doesn't include this other guy, Elihu. And so Elihu, and, and so then you have to be very discerning as you go through what Elihu says, because the translations can sometimes make it look like Elihu said wrong things when he actually did not. And so uh, here we go in chapter 32, verse 1, Job's three friends refused to reply further to him. 
because he kept insisting on his innocence. Uh, and then verse 2, it says, Then Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzite of the clan of Ram, became angry. He was angry because Job refused to admit that he had sinned and that God was right in punishing him. Uh, so then, so here, here is, is where we get into the problem with the translation, because he says he was, ang he was angry because Job refused to admit that he had sinned and that God was right in punishing him. Actually, uh, if you read, if you compare this to uh, a host of other translations, they all say because Job had justified himself rather than God. It doesn't say that, because this would imply that Elihu is in, is in agreement that God is punishing Job when actually he is not. He's neutral on that ground. He doesn't say that, he never says that uh, God is punishing Job, uh, but he is angry because Job has justified himself before God, or rather than God. And uh, then he says he, he was also angry with Job's three friends, for they made God appear to be wrong by their inability to answer Job's arguments. Actually, the text does not say that. We can, find, we can see that easily just by comparing this with other translations and see that they did not say that. Uh, the other translations um, just say that they, because of their inability to refute Job. You know, and so what that means, it, it, doesn't make, it, doesn't, it didn't make God appear to be wrong because the three friends couldn't refute Job. Um, but they couldn't refute Job, and he did say some wrong things. Now, he never abandoned God, but he did say some wrong things. And so, uh, and Elihu knows it, because he's been listening the whole time. And Elihu calls him on it. So in verse 4, it says, Elihu had waited for the others to speak to Job, because they were older than he. But when he saw that they had no further reply, he spoke out angrily. Elihu, son of Bar Barakel the Buzite, said, now again, uh, it gave his lineage. He's from the, the family of Ram, and Ram, um, you know, or uh, uh, you know, that's that's Ram was one of the people that was in the descent the, in the line, uh, you know, from Noah, and so he is a uh, he is not a Jew, but he is a kinsman, and the Jews don't technically exist at the time of the writing of Job, but he is a kinsperson of then that family. He's he's from a different uh, line, but he but he's a, a person. Uh, who would have been acquainted, uh, you know, with the ways of God, or at least an oral tradition. So then he says, I am young and you are old. So I held back from telling you what I think. I thought those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. But there is a spirit within people, the breath of the Almighty within them that makes them intelligent. Sometimes the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. So listen to me and let me tell you what I think. And so he, he is saying now, um, he is talking about divine revelation. He's talking about because of the operation of God, uh, of God's uh, spirit in a person's life, it is possible for them to have revelation. Now, he's right about that. And we've seen that because we talked about that in the previous episode where Job talked about all these different types of sins. Well, how would they know that those were sin? Because they didn't have a written law, but they did have an understanding from the Almighty about the difference between right and wrong. And so what, jo what he's saying here is correct. So he says in verse 11, I have waited all this time listening very carefully to your arguments, listening to you grope for words. What's he talking about? Verbal processing. I have listened, but not one of you has refuted Job or answered his arguments. And don't tell me he's too wise for us. Only God can convince him. If Job had ar been arguing with me, I would, not use, uh, I would not answer with your kind of logic. See, the kind of what's he talking about? What kind of logic were they answering with? They were answering with, traditions of men they they kept saying over and over again ask the ancients and they will tell you so they they were they were falling back on acquired knowledge and the problem is not falling back on acquired knowledge the problem is acting like that knowledge is unquestionable Say, acting like you can't question this because that's exactly the problem that uh, the the pharisees kept encountering with jesus because they had begun to uh, receive their oral traditions as though they were commands from God without questioning it, and they were not comparing it to the actual word of God that they had received. And if they, because if they had been, they would have seen that their so their traditions had gone off, and they were not in alignment with God's word. And uh, so that that happens with people quite a bit. They they want to, um, they want to interpret God's word with their their religious. Um, their religious lens, you know, they want to take their denominational lens of what their their group teaches, and they want to interpret it through that instead of just taking the word for what it is. 
you know, instead of relying on a relationship with God to uh, to discern this word. And so he says here, verse 15, you sit there baffled with nothing more to say. Should I continue to wait now that you are silent? Must I also remain silent? No, I will say my piece. I will speak my mind, for I am full of pent-up words, and the spirit within me urges me on. I am like a cask of wine without a vent, like a new wineskin ready to burst. I must speak to find relief, so let me give my answers. I won't play favorites or try to flatter anyone, for if I tried flattery, my creator would soon destroy me. And so he understands that uh, to show favoritism or to show partiality is not from God. Um, in other words, because if you do that, then you can't judge with equity. You can't judge with righteousness. You can't you can't say, let's be fair, you know, because you're partial to one person over the other. That's why God told the people, you can't be partial when you're judging matters, whether they're poor or they're rich. That doesn't matter. You have to to use justice, you know, judge with uh, right scales, right, right, righteous scales. And so he says, um, <clears throat> he's I'm, I'm like a wineskin ready to burst. I think this is interesting because Jesus t- Jesus talked about this very very thing when they were dealing with these uh, traditions. You know, they came to Jesus and they said, "How come your disciple? How come our, the Pharisees are like? How come our disciples and the disciples of John fast, but your disciples don't fast?" Jesus, what's that about? In other words, they were taking your tradition and they were saying, "Why don't why don't you line up? Why don't you fit in with this?" Uh, this pattern that we think you should be fitting into, Jesus. You know, that's why they're asking him. And Jesus Jesus says, can can old wine be, be put into new wineskins? You know, and so what's he saying? So so what is a new wineskin? What is an old wineskin? So when he says, I'm like a, a new wineskin ready to burst, he's already established that I, he's like, there's a, there is a spirit, the spirit of God within man that gives him intelligence. If, and he's like saying, if, if you're willing to, to listen, if you're willing to learn from God. And so that's what like a new wineskin would be. Jesus is like, you don't, you, new wine must be put into new wineskins, you know? And so uh, he was saying that the doctrine that I'm going to be bringing is not going to fit in line with your doctrine. It would completely destroy your doctrine. In other words, he's like, you've got these old wine skins. You, you're unwilling to, to change. See, because when you put new wine into new wine skins, it expands during that process um, of becoming old wine. And so he said, if you put it, so the, the old wine skins have already been stretched. So if you put new wine into them, they can't stretch any further for the new wine and they burst. And so he is, so it's a principle of, are you willing to receive instruction from God, even if it doesn't line up with your tradition, even if it doesn't line up with the way that you have been conditioned to think and that you have allowed yourself to, to think? See, because uh, Job tested their traditions that they had brought. They, they kept say, bringing up the same thing again, and Job's like, it's not, it's not working. It doesn't make any sense based on what we've seen here. In other words, your tradition has been tried and found to be wrong. But they kept clinging to their tradition and acting like you shouldn't question this, Job. This is just the way it is. And Job is like, it's not the way it is. And uh, Job was right to to call them on that because it was uh, it was found out to be to be uh, wrong. And uh, so he so then so so Elihu is beginning this by saying, I'm going to be fair to everybody. I'm not going to I'm not going to show any partiality to anybody. He's like, but we're he's like, but we're going to we're going to be honest about these things. And so then chapter 33 says, listen to my words, Job, pay attention, pay attention to what I have to say. Now that I have begun to speak, let me continue. I will speak with all sincerity. I speak the truth for the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. Answer me if you can make your case and take your stand. Look, you and I both belong to God. I too was formed from clay, so you don't need to be afraid of me. I won't come down hard on you. You have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard your very words. You said, I am pure. I am without sin. I am innocent. I have no guilt. God is picking a quarrel with me, and he considers me his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches my every move. But you are wrong, and I will show you why. For God is greater than any human being. So why are you bringing a charge against him? What say does, excuse me, what say, why say he does not respond to people's complaints? So what God, so that that's the thing that Job has brought before. He's he's saying he is like, look at all these things that befell me. Why has God not answered me? 
And uh, so he is saying, so what Elihu is saying is that God does answer. He doesn't answer in the way you want him to. Because he says here, verse uh, 14, for God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams, in visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes them turn from doing wrong. He keeps them from pride. He protects them from the grave from crossing over the river of death, or God disciplines people with pain on their sick beds. Now, I will say, as a translation note here, that again, all the translations that I've read besides this don't say sick bed, that just says bed. So this is an opinion that's, that, that crept in while they were coming up with this translation. Does that mean that we should not use this translation? No, but it means we need to be discerning. Just like Job was talking, or just like Elihu was talking about here, because we have the Spirit of God, we can understand these things, and when we compare these different translations, and then we can look up the text too, we can see what God is speaking, and we can, because we can, we can tell the difference. Thank you. We can tell the difference. Okay, so I'm going to move on from this point, but I'm just saying that uh, it says beds; it doesn't say sick beds. See, because my personal belief is that God does not put sickness on anybody. If He did then we would have seen Jesus doing that because he said, he who seen me has seen the Father. And the works that uh, that I do, they're the Father doing these works. And Jesus never put sickness on anybody. Now, God does allow pain, but I believe that sickness is a device of the enemy, that he has somehow managed to pervert uh, the things in the earth to, to cause sickness. Because since the beginning, we've had bacteria and stuff. But before the fall, were they serving any kind of negative purpose? No. But now we live post fall. The first recorded sickness of first reported uh, case of sickness in Scripture took place after the fall. And then Jesus, we see taking sickness away from people. So God's not using sickness to teach anybody any lessons, but He does allow pain and consequences for things, because that's different entirely. Verse twenty: They lost their appetite for even the most delicious food. Uh, for even the most delicious food. Their flesh wastes away and their bones stick out. They are a death's door and angels of death wait for them. And again, it's to note that the word angel is translated messenger. It does not always mean uh, an angel. It does not always mean an angelic being. Sometimes a uh, it's just a messenger, somebody who's been sent to proclaim a message. So then he, verse 23, but if an angel from heaven appears, a special messenger to intercede for a person and declare that he is upright, he will be gracious and say, remove him from the grave, for I have found a ransom for his life. Now, I remember one of Job's friends was talking about intercession. If your way is right before the Lord, and you plead and you intercede on somebody else's behalf, God will save that that person. And this is really what Elihu is talking about here. I don't believe he's talking about an angelic being, a messenger sent from heaven, sent from God to, in, to make intercession on behalf of another. We know God does that. And I believe that's what Elihu is talking about here. Verse 24, he will be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave, for I have found a ransom for his life. Verse 25, then his body will become as healthy as a child's, firm and youthful again. When he prays to God, he will be accepted, and God will receive him with joy and restore him to good standing. What's good standing? Righteousness. Good standing with God. That's what, uh, what righteousness is. Verse 27, he will declare to his friends, I sinned and twisted the truth, but it was not worth it. God rescued me from the grave, and now my life is filled with light. So what's he talking about here? When God rescues a person from death and they begin to proclaim what God has done for them, then God is speaking through them because they are now acting as a messenger from God to speak to other people. So God speaks in all these different ways. So really what Job's mistake was, not that he sinned because we, we know that he didn't sin. He did no sin that caused his calamity. His mistake was that he demanded to be heard in court by God. In other words, I demand that God speak to me the way I want him to speak to me. And that is wrong. Okay. Uh, so Elihu is like, God speaks however he wants to speak and is not accountable to us. And he's correct. <clears throat> so verse 25, yes, God does these things again and again for people. He rescues them from the grave so they may enjoy the light of life. So what does God, what does God want to give people? Life. God wants people to enjoy the light of life. God is a giver of life. Verse 31, Mark this well, Job. Listen to me, for I have more to say. But if you have anything to say, go ahead. Speak, for I am anxious to see you justified. But if not, then listen to me. 
keep silent and I will teach you wisdom. So what he's doing is he's reasserting again that I am presenting this for your discernment. He's like, do you have an answer against this, Job? So we just see the text. I believe he actually paused and waited to see if Job had something to say. And Job didn't say anything because he because what he is saying is correct. So he's like, let's let me present to you what I am saying to you. And so this really is uh, very similar to what I was talking about earlier when it comes to prophecy, because anything any because prophecy is just uh, utterance that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And so when we speak that out, that doesn't mean that it's it's uh, it's infallible because God is speaking through us and we can make mistakes. OK, that's why prophecy must be judged. And it doesn't. And, you know, the way that Paul presented it when he said that let let the two or three prophesy and let the others judge. He didn't necessarily say that it had to be done in such a way that the person speaks it out and then the people all take turns judging it verbally. Or, or there's one person who has to say, yes, this is wrong. This, this is right. No, let everybody in the church judge it and examine it for themselves personally. Okay. Uh, now, if something, if they're saying something that's just flat out unscriptural, then yeah, somebody should say that's, I'm sorry, but the, but that, that does not line up with God's word. But every, but so when I was, the whole time I was pastoring, I was teaching people, you have, whenever somebody speaks a word over you, they, they, they you, you believe they're speaking prophecy, you must judge it. You must discern it. You must know how to do it personally in light of this, because this is the plumb line. And so, uh, so uh, Elihu is being fair. He's like, I'm presenting this to you for you to judge. You know, and Job has nothing to say so far. Verse 34, or chapter 34, and, and we'll finish with chapter 34. Then Elihu said, listen to me, you wise men. Pay attention, you who have knowledge. Job said, the ear tests the words it hears, just as the mouth distinguishes between foods. Same thing we're talking about here, discernment. <clears throat> so. He says, so let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. This would be a, a hard thing for people. And I've seen it happen where people say, but, the, but what, what does the Bible say? And so you tell them what the Bible says, but then there's more than one translation. And they may differ in their, trans, in their renderings of what the text says. And so people go, you know, it's like they, they get so afraid. It's like, well, but then what translation do I listen to? Well, so, so they're all translations of the text. So you take them together and you discern them and you can see when you when you read these different translations and you know God, you know the spirit of God, because Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us into all truth. Doesn't mean that we we throw away the translations because they are translations of the text. So unless you want to learn the Greek and the Hebrew, you're going to have to rely on the translations. But you can take them together and you can say they are all agreement in agreement on this. See, because let every word be established by two or three witnesses. And so Jesus himself said the same thing in, um, in the Gospels. He was like, why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? Now, he doesn't mean to just decide this is right, this is wrong. He means based on the witness of the Holy Spirit within us and the word of God, which we have been given. So he says, Let's, let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. Okay. Now, another thing, too, in the Philippians, it talks about how you uh, let us let us agree together as far as we have attained, you know, because not everybody is at the same place uh, spiritually. And so as we read the word together, let us agree together. Let us. And he said, and Paul said, and if any of you disagree on these things, then I believe that God will help you get to get to the root of it, because there's lots of things that are, are gray area. And so we need to find our common ground in Christ and let him be our foundation, and then we have we have a, a equal footing with one another on these things. So then verse 5, For Job also said, I am innocent, but God has taken away my rights. I am innocent, but they call me a liar. My suffering is incurable, though I have not sinned. Now here's another translation point in verse 7. He says, Tell me, has there ever been a man like Job with his thirst for irreverent talk? Now, uh, if you look up, if you look, it, like if you go to Bible Hub and you type in, uh, Job 34 7 and you look at all these different translations it it's talking about scorn is there anyone who uh, who like Job who who drinks scorn like water you know in other words Job has become a glutton for punishment 
and by saying over and over again, woe is me. You know, in other words, as some people have said, Job is throwing himself a pity party and no one likes it to go to another person's pity party because they're, they're, they're stuck in this victim thing of everyone's against me, or in this case, Job's like, God's apparently against me. Now, he started off with that because he, he doesn't know about Satan. So it's like, well, God's against me, I guess. And so because they kept at him and kept saying, no, Job, you must have sinned. Then Job got galvanized in this thinking of, no, I did not sin. And he was right about that. But he was wrong to say, God has taken away my rights. Now, God has a right to take away our rights, but God wouldn't do that. God has the right to do that because God is the just judge of the earth and he can do whatever he wants. But the point is, is that God will not do wrongfully because he, 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 he cannot do it because he will not do it. And so because he will not do it, he cannot do it. You see? So then he, he says, um, uh, <clears throat> verse 8. Now, again, here's the concept I was talking about earlier. When you become as something that you did not intend to. So he says, he chooses evil people as companions. He spends his time with wicked men. Why, uh, he has even said, why waste time trying to please God? Now, he did say that it's like, well, apparently if God is going to, to Job thought since God, God was the one that caused the calamity, that what well then is it is there really any good what's the point of, of living a righteous life he's now he said i was never going to abandon living a righteous life but he was asking what good is it done and so so what's happened here is is it's not elihu is not saying that he really has chosen evil people as his companions physically what he is saying here is that because job has um job has become like a glutton for punishment job has chosen to drink scorn like water Job has said, what is the good of, of living a righteous life? It's as though he has become like the wicked because he has adopted their philosophy. Their philosophy is, well, we don't see anything bad happening right away, so it must be okay to do whatever we want. And so they just go and do whatever they want. Now, Job has not done that, but, he, it, but what his, his reasoning has done has equated with that. It skews as that. He has not said, I'm going to, uh, what's the point of being righteous? I'm just going to become wicked. But he has asked the same question that wicked people ask. And therefore, in essence, he has adopted that concept. And that makes him wrong. Okay, that's what Elihu is saying here. So verse 10, listen to me, you who have understanding. Everyone knows that God doesn't sin. The Almighty can do no wrong. Why? Because he will do no wrong. We just said that. Verse 11, he repays people according to their deeds. He treats people as they deserve, whether right or wrong. Verse 12, truly God will do no wrong. God will not do wrong. The Almighty will not twist justice. Did someone else put the world in his care? Who set the world in place? The whole world in place, excuse me. If God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease. And humanity would turn again to dust. Why? Because they understand that God breathed into man the breath of life. And if God were to take that away, Men would become the clay again that God formed with his hands before he breathed life into it. And so he is saying, God's not been appointed as the judge of the earth. Why? Because he made the earth. He, because he is perfect and because he's the one that made it, he didn't need anybody to appoint him. He just is. So then uh, he says in verse 16, now listen to me if you are wise. Pay attention to what I say. Could God govern if he hated justice? <laughs> and this is a really good way to put it. And we've talked about this before. If God were unjust, we would have no concept of justice. So Job has said, it's, Job is like, well, if God is doing these things for no reason, then God must be unjust. But it's like, Job, that statement makes no sense. Because if God was unjust, you wouldn't even be able to say what was just or unjust. So it's it's a it's that 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 argument circles back upon itself and just is obliterated because you can't you can't say that God's unjust because if God was unjust who created us then we wouldn't know what justice is. So he's like, could God govern if he hated justice? The answer is no. So therefore, if God hated justice, there wouldn't be anything good in this world. It would be complete chaos, full of full of evil everywhere. There wouldn't be anything good, and there are good things in the world still. And if there's anything good in the world still, it's because God had his hand on it at some point. So then, <clears throat> he, 
He says, are you going to condemn the almighty judge? Verse 18, for he says to kings, you are wicked, and to nobles, you are unjust. He doesn't care how great a person may be, and he pays no, no more attention to the rich than to the poor. He made them all. In a moment they die. In the middle of the night they pass away. The mighty are removed without human hand. For God watches how people live. He sees everything they do. No darkness is thick enough to hide the wicked from his eyes. We don't set the time when we will come before God in judgment. What's he saying? Job, you don't get to decide how God answers you or when God answers you. You don't get to decide that. And so people feel this way all the time. They feel that because they have been dealt something that's unfair, that God must answer. You know, I've had this, I've had all these things happen in my life, all this pain, all this suffering, and all these terrible things that have happened. Where is God in all of it? Now, it's not wrong to ask God, where are you? But it is wrong to demand that God must answer the way we want him to and in the timing that we want. And that's what Elihu is saying. Elihu is like, Job, you're wrong. And, and he's right. Job is wrong for demanding that. So he says, um, verse 23 again, we don't set the time when we will come before God in judgment. He brings the mighty to ruin without asking anyone. And he sets up others in their place. He knows what they do. And in the night he overturns and destroys them. He strikes them down because they are wicked, doing it openly for all to see. For they turn away from following him. They have no respect for any of his ways. They turn. So why, why then uh, are people removed from their place? Because they turn away from following God. And in so doing, they cause a lot of harm in other people's lives. Verse 28, they cause the poor to cry out, catching God's attention. He hears the cries of the needy. But if he chooses to remain quiet, who can criticize him? When he hides his face, no one can find him, whether an individual or a nation. He prevents the godless from ruling, so they cannot be a snare to the people. So he prevents them, you could say, from continuing to rule, because the wicked do come up into places of power, but then God removes them. So again, here's where you compare the, uh, the scripture with scripture, because he has said, uh, if people are in power, he's already said that there's wicked in, the, in power sometimes. And then he comes to the statement that he prevents the godless from ruling. So then you have to take that together with the other one and say, he's not saying that God never allows them to come to power. He's saying he will not allow them to stay in power, is what he's saying. That's how you can reconcile that. So the verse 31, why don't people say to God, I have sinned, but will sin no more? Or I don't know what evil I have done. Tell me if I have done wrong, I will stop at once. Why don't people ask God? Why don't people go to God? Why do they demand that God come to them? Verse 33, must God tailor his justice to your demands? But you have rejected him. The choice is yours, not mine. Go ahead, share your wisdom with us. After all, bright people will tell me and wise people will hear me say, Job speaks out of ignorance. His words lack insight. Job, you deserve the maximum penalty for the wicked way you have talked. For you have added rebellion to your sin. You show no respect, and you speak many angry words against God. Now, now, hold, hold on a minute, because again, the translation, compare the other translations, it says he has multiplied words against God. Now, see again, and I'm going to end this with this same note, this same concept of something becoming as another thing. So, uh, again, we'll go back to that first example. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It is not the sin of witchcraft, but its effects equate to the effects of witchcraft. So, in the same way, if there's a difference between directly speaking angrily against God directly or speaking angrily about your situation, which then puts God on the witness stand. And those are two different things. Job has not, has not directly declared anger to God. You know, so the translation failed us here where they translated it. Elihu was saying, and actually the, the translation say he has multiplied words against the Almighty, against God. So what has happened is, is that Job, because he has insisted on, I am innocent and God has not answered me. Because he has said that, he has multiplied his words against God without directly speaking against God. But yet those words are, are multiplied against God. So, so Elihu, so this is Elihu's way of, he did not say that Job has spoken directly against God, but he did say, you have, your words have been multiplied against God. And so there's, there's the difference. So in other words, it's again, 
it's rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, although it is not. And I'm not saying that witchcraft has anything to do with what Job is saying here. But I'm just using that as an example so that we can understand the concept. Okay. And so uh, very important to understand the difference. Um, and so Job, and so the this is the last closing thought I will leave and then we'll, we'll go. So Job um, has listened intently to what Elihu has said. And Elihu has given him more than one chance to interject. And um, Job hasn't said anything. So Job is listening to what Elihu has to say. And Elihu hasn't said anything incorrect. So, in other words, Elihu is bringing shades of meaning through revelation from God that is challenging the friends' tradition and is also challenging Job's philosophies that he's adopted and got himself into trouble with. And they are listening. So that's a good thing. So go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for this, for this word. I thank you, Father God. For your help in understanding these complicated things it's it, it in the beginning things were so simple lord you made everything so simple but because of sin this is why things have become complicated because of the way that people think it has become very complicated you're not the one who has complicated things father it is uh sin that's complicated things and so i thank you for your wisdom in discerning these things and helping us to understand your heart and why things happen the way that they happen. And I thank you for these things. I ask that you bless everyone who tunes in here with me. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.